Good morning, early risers. We're going to get this show started. Uh, welcome to the 10th TAM Sunday paper session. And uh, we have a, a lineup of six speakers for you. I really appreciate you showing up at this hour. I don't know what they're thinking, 8 o'clock in the morning on Sunday in Las Vegas. Uh, but uh, we're going to get started. So uh, our first speaker is uh, Dr. Martha Keller. Uh, Keller is a, uh, Dr. Keller is a veterinarian who lives and practices in uh, St. Petersburg, Florida. She also founded the Pinellas County Skeptics and organizes their events. And today, Dr. Keller will speak on where these two, uh, uh, her professional and her skeptical passions intersect, and that is quackery no longer refers to ducks, the growing practice of CAM in veterinary medicine. So please welcome to the stage, Dr. Keller. Thanks everybody for showing up so early, I appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna talk about, uh, give you kind of just a little primer on the state of alternative medicine in the veterinary field. Uh, veterinary medicine has changed a lot in the last couple decades. It's pretty uncommon now for a vet to be able to do everything just because it's such a growing field. Uh, most vets specialize not only in uh, individual species but also in specialties much like uh, physicians nowadays. The main organizing body for veterinarians, at least in the US, is the American Veterinary Medical Association. And they have issued a position statement on alternative medicine. And the most important sentence, I think, in, in the statement is that claims for safety and effectiveness ultimately should be proven by the scientific method. And while that's a great statement, unfortunately, it, it pretty much is just a position statement. It doesn't have uh, much effect. Now, veterinarians certainly aren't as large in number as physicians, but there are about 98,000 vets in the U.S., um, and about 68% of households have a pet. So majority of households in the U.S. visit the veterinarian at least once a year. Now, I'm not going to talk about the different modalities in specific. I'm sure most of you are very familiar with them, but I'm going to talk more about how they relate to the veterinary field in general. This is a screenshot of a institute where veterinarians can go and learn about acupuncture. Um, they're taught the China, a traditional Chinese method, um, learn about qi, various things are taught, uh, tongue and pulse diagnosis, uh, different acupuncture techniques. And pretty much it, there is no limit to the species that, that uh, acupuncture is practiced on, dogs, cats. Obviously that's a porcupine attack, not acupuncture, but I'm sure a few points were hit there. <laughs> and even some of the more exotic species, like uh, guinea pigs, sea turtles, or even fish aren't immune to having needles poked in them. So how do they know where to put the needles? Well, contrary to what you might, they might tell you, the uh, acupuncture meridians weren't really even developed until about the 1970s. And they basically transposed the known human points to animals, which is why they have ridiculous points such as the gallbladder point in the horse when horses don't even have a gallbladder. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the next modality I'm going to talk about is chiropractic, and this one's a little bit different. Uh, the American Veterinary Chiropractic Association, yes there is one, uh, does credential doctors in veterinary chiropractic. Unfortunately, human chiropractors have gotten in the mix. They credential both human chiropractors and veterinarians. In the latest month, the, uh, they certified 36 total doctors, 21 of which were human chiropractics, which means that 58% were not veterinarians. This is a map of the US uh, showing where the different laws uh, affect veterinarians and chiropractors. In the blue states, only veterinarians can practice chiropractic. In the red states, human chiropractors can practice under supervision. And in the purple states, chiropractors can practice on animals without any uh, supervision whatsoever. And the rest of the states are blank because the laws regarding uh, alternative medicine are pretty vague. So I'm going to give you just a quick comparison of what it takes for a human chiropractor uh, to be accredited by the Chiropractic Association versus, say, another human type uh, uh, treater like a, like a veterinary or a human dentist. 
chiropractor needs to attend an approved animal chiropractic course, which is about a month-long course, pass exit exams at the end of the course, then some written and clinical exams, and then they're good to go. But if a human dentist decides he wants to extend his practice to include animals, the veterinary dental board does have a procedure. They have to go to vet school. That's four years. They have to complete a one-year internship, then another year of dental practice, then they have to pass their dental boards, and only then can they then practice on animals. So what's the difference here? Well, the difference is, is with chiropractic, their entire theory is based on subluxation. So it doesn't matter whether it's an animal or human, they're gonna approach the patient the same way. Whereas when you look at the veterinary dental board, amazingly, they actually take a holistic approach they realize you need to have a fundamental understanding of the whole patient, whether there's diabetes or renal disease involved, and they uh, insist that you go back to vet school. Here's a screenshot of a human chiropractic advertising that uh, he practices on animals. Uh, just as an aside, that's about the worst type of x-ray you could possibly take. Um, and there are battles between the two groups. For instance, in uh, Georgia, some veterinary chiropractors are getting cease and desist orders from the Human Chiropractic Association for using the term chiropractic, which they state can only be used when pertaining to the human body. They recommend uh, other terms such as animal adjustment or animal subluxation-based care. Now homeopathy. We're going to talk a little bit about homeopathy. And yes, sadly, there is an academy of veterinary homeopathy, and these are veterinarians doing this. They do offer a certification uh -uh. in veterinary homeopathy. <laughs> and to be certified, again, it's a 125-hour course. At this point, only one course exists. They have to submit two acute and two chronic case reports. I'd love to read those. Complete written exam, which you take at home and you have two weeks to complete. <laughs> and then you can call yourself a certified veterinary homeopath. Well, what's the benefit of doing this? Well, the uh, organizing body will then back you up in the case of any legal challenges, provided that you follow their standard operating protocols. And I'd like to list a couple for you. Here's one. Drugs and methods of treatment which are not homeopathic to the case are to be avoided because of the possibility of interference with the progress of cure. So basically, don't use what works. Here's another one. Symptoms on the skin or surface of the body that have expressed as a localized lesion are not to be treated in a vigorous way with the intent to cause their disappearance or by surgery. So if you have a mass or a lesion that's amenable to surgery, don't do it. And sadly, there is a need for homeopaths out there. This is a listing uh, for, they're looking for a veterinarian that also has a master's degree, four to 10 years of experience, and a solid knowledge of homeopathic remedies. And yes, there are states where only licensed veterinarians can practice homeopathy. So if you're in any of these states, don't do this if you're worried about dehydration, because you could be uh, practicing medicine without a license. <laughs> now, pet food. If you look on the internet, there's a lot of scary things that you'll find about pet food. Um, too many to list in the in this short talk, um, but here's just a screenshot of one. They talk a lot about the horrible things in pet food. They like to call out meat byproducts and how horrific it is to have meat byproducts uh, in, uh, in the pet food. So let's take a closer look and see what, what exactly are meat byproducts. The Association of American Feed Control Officials has defined it as the non-rendered clean parts other than meat derived from slaughtered mammals. It includes, but is not limited to, lungs, spleen, kidneys, brain, livers, blood, bone, partially defied at low temperature fatty tissue, and stomachs and intestines free to their contents. It's not include hair, horns, teeth, and hoofs. So the question is, when feeding animals, is this horrific? Well, what we can do is we can look to the wild animals and see what, what do they eat. Well, <laughs> when we look and see what they're eating, they don't seem very opposed to eating meat byproducts. Um, they're not just eating the leg of lamb. Just because we may not want to eat it doesn't mean they don't. Here's another screenshot, uh, you know, road kills in your food. Um, one of the catchphrases they like to talk about is the four Ds. These, 
the four D's that are in your, your animal's pet food. So what, what are these four D's? Well, the first thing they claim is in your pet food are dead animals. Well, the next, <laughs> the next time you open your bag of food and a cow comes out, please let me know. That'd be interesting. Dying. Well, that's pretty vague. Aren't we all dying? What, is, what does dying mean? Diseased. Well, perhaps they mean disease, but if that's the case, that is not legal. Diseased animals cannot go into the, the food supply. Disabled. Again, not legal, especially after bovine spongiform encephalopathy. Um, basically, if an animal cannot walk into the slaughterhouse, it cannot uh, go into the food supply. So, people against using pet food propose BARF. And what do I mean by that? Well, that means biologically appropriate raw food. Uh, they feel that feeding raw food is more natural. You don't destroy the nutrients with the cooking process. Uh, they claim a lot of health benefits, a good coat, good skin, helps with renal disease. Unfortunately, when you look at the studies, uh, a lot of these foods are very deficient in certain nutrients, and it puts both the animals and the humans at much higher risk of uh, certain bacterial diseases like salmonella, because not only you're handling raw food, uh, but they're shedding it in the feces. Here's another screenshot. PETA is uh, advocating meatless meals for dogs and cats. They want animals to go vegan. And while that might not be so bad for dogs, there's no veterinary nutritionist that I've talked to that would ever recommend a, a vegetarian diet for an obligate carnivore like a cat. So what's going on in vet schools? Well, I did a kind of an informal survey of the uh, veterinary websites looking at the teaching hospitals and the, how they list uh, any um, alternative medicine courses. And about half of them do have some type of alternative medicine in the teaching hospitals. Most of them uh, practice acupuncture, some herbal medicine, uh, but even one does an elective course in, in homeopathy, sadly enough. So continuing education. Most professional groups require members to have continuing education credits. In the veterinary field, it's handled by RACE, the Registry of Approved Continuing Education. And the purpose of that, uh, that board is to provide uniform standards for the courses that uh, are approved. Well, the Academy of Veterinary Homeopathy recently uh, submitted some courses for approval, and they were denied. Whereas previously, they'd been approved. So what, what happened? Well, the race standards were recently updated. And uh, the, they wanted the courses to follow the medically accepted and scientifically supported standards of experimental design, data collection, and analysis. Well, this didn't make the homeopaths happy, because they, race decided that their courses did not meet these standards. Race countered, or the homeopaths countered, that this decision was giving weight to published science rather than experts in homeopathy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what do they do? Well, they make their own accrediting body. RAVE stands for the Registry of Alternative and Integrative Veterinary Medical Education. And its purpose, they hope, is to certify alternative medicine courses for continuing education. Uh, fortunately, no states as of yet uh, use RAVE or accept RAVE credits, but it's certainly something we need to keep uh, in, our, in our minds and in our radar. So future, I hope I've given you just a little bit of uh, insight into what's going on in the veterinary field. There certainly is a, a lot of woo, more than I could really uh, talk about completely in, in the short talk. Um, but. Uh, you know, we have to keep a, keep a close eye. Meetings like this will help. Education will help. Um, and I'd be happy to take any questions that anybody may have. Test, test, ah. So thank you for that illuminating, if not slightly depressing talk. <laughs> That's great. Do we have any, we have time for maybe one or two questions? Ah. Hi, given that um, homeopathy is based on a placebo effect, how do they get a placebo effect 
out of animals that convinces their owners that the medicine, in quotes, is working? Well, it's, it's commonly stated that there's no placebo in effect in animals, and that's, that's not true. Uh, because when you're measuring the effectiveness of, say, a, a pain medication, the person is the one that's reporting it to you. The owner is reporting it to you. So there's a placebo effect in the owner. If the owner feels like it's going to work, uh, which anyone using CAM often does, they're the ones that's going to, that, that will look for the signs that their animal is limping less or seems more comfortable. So there, it, there is a placebo effect in animals. Um, I'm heavily involved in the animal industry, and I was wondering how we can get in touch with you or get information from you to pass on to people to educate them properly. Um, I mean, you can email me. Um, I'm on Facebook. And there's a, you know, I'm not the only, certainly the only one. There's a lot, there's a group, good group of veterinarians that want to have science-based medicine. Uh, and the, the information is out there. Um, what can we do if we find out that our veterinarian or veterinarian clinic is starting to get involved with uh, CAM practices? What I tell people is, you know, challenge them. See what, ask them for the evidence, ask them for the papers. I do the same when I visit clinics and they are, they're doing it. I ask them for papers, I just never receive them. And if you don't get the answer that, that you like, switch to another vet and let them know why. Because it's, it's only when the, they start to see the effect in the pocketbook that I think they're gonna finally wake up and ask, you know, what am I doing here? Right, thank you guys. <laughs>